Welcome to the line side chat. If you want to just check that your audio is working, we will get started in just a minute. All right, welcome to Penn State Burke's Line Side Chats. My name is Ryan Hassler, and I'm one of the three Line Side Chat moderators working alongside Don Pfeiffer Wrights and Sonia De La Cueto. Come on in and welcome to our campus. We are so glad that you could join us today. Before we get started, we wanted to share that you should please feel free to submit questions through the pro throughout the program via the question and answer feature. Uh, we will not be utilizing the chat or the raise hand feature for this presentation. Uh, once our presentation concludes, we will facilitate a discussion with our presenter, and we will also be recording today's session so you can revisit the topic or even share the experience with friends and family. Now we are excited to introduce Dr. Jennifer Murphy. Um, Dr. Murphy is an associate professor and the program chair of criminal justice at Penn State Berks, and she has been a faculty member at Penn State um, for the last five years. So welcome, Jennifer. Um, she will be speaking about the impact of COVID-19 on the drug overdose crisis. So at this point, I'll invite you to share your screen, Dr. Murphy, and I look forward to your chat. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am going to talk about the drug overdose crisis and what has been happening uh, in the context of our other crisis, the current pandemic. So today I want to talk a little bit first about the background on the drug overdose crisis in the United States and how we got to where we are. Uh, and then I'll talk about how COVID-19, uh, how that has impacted overdose rates and then what is currently being done to try to reduce overdose deaths both locally and across the nation. So first, starting with a pop quiz, uh, about how many people in the United States died of a drug overdose in 2019? Was it 700, 7,000, 70,000, or 700? Thousand, and the answer is seventy thousand. It's actually closer to seventy-one thousand, uh, and this uh, these are new numbers that just came out about a month ago, uh, and they were concerning um, one because it's it's a high number, obviously uh, seventy-one thousand people in the United States dying of a drug overdose is a large number. Uh, and it was also concerning because it showed an increase from 2018. Uh, some people had been optimistic that we were starting to see a decline in the overdose death rate. There was a drop of about 4% between 2017 and 2018. Uh, so it's been concerning that the numbers coming out from 2019 are actually showing back to an increase in the number of drug overdose deaths, um, suggesting we're not moving in the right direction. If we look across the United States, we see a great deal of variability of uh, death rates. So here, um, the states that are darkest red are the ones that have the highest drug overdose death rate. And this is 2018 data. Uh, we don't have this level of data yet for 2019. It takes a while to get all of that data and put it into this kind of format where you can make broad comparisons. Um, but as you can see, if we're looking at uh, our state of Pennsylvania, it's one of the dark red states indicating that we have one of the highest drug overdose death rates in the country. Uh, and indeed, um, if you ranked all the states, we would come out fourth. So we have the fourth highest overdose death rate. Um, we are just behind West Virginia, Maryland and Delaware. Uh, and then the states that come right after us include Ohio and New Hampshire. 
So you can also see that it's a regional phenomenon that rates tend to cluster uh, in certain areas and we are living in a particularly hard hit region in the United States as far as overdose deaths. Putting um, some more context for Pennsylvania, um, a breakdown of overdose deaths in 2018. Most um, overdose deaths occurred in the age range of 25 to 34, so relatively young members of the population. About 70% of overdose deaths were males and about 79% of overdose deaths were non-Hispanic whites. Uh, so we have seen an increase in the number of overdose deaths for people of color, um, but in Pennsylvania, statewide at least, um, this is primarily a uh, problem for young white males. If we look at the state, we'll also see a great deal of variability across counties. Uh, so here again is 2018 data, It's a little fuzzy the map, uh, but the states in the darker red are the ones with the higher overdose death rates. Uh, and if we looked at this kind of map uh, on a year to year basis, we see actually a lot of change happens year to year. Um, some consistency, so for instance, Philadelphia, dark red here, consistently the highest overdose death rate in the state. Um, but this map looks a lot different than the previous year's map. The previous year's map would have shown a lot of the counties in the southwest part of the state, Allegheny County, right, the Pittsburgh area, the surrounding counties there, um, they would have been a lot darker red. But they have shown some significant improvements between 2017 and 2018. Um, decreasing their overall rates. So, so the, these county-wide, county comparisons um, tend to fluctuate quite a bit. Uh, if we looked at Berks County, Berks County in um, 2019 had 127 overdose deaths, and that would place Berks about middle uh, among all of the counties in the state. Um, they, Berks did see a big increase from 2015 um, but overall, you know, they're around the median of if we ranked all the counties across the state. So what is responsible for causing these deaths? Uh, about 70% of all drug overdose deaths involve opioids. So um, opioids are currently the main driver of drug overdose deaths. Um, there are 80% of all drug overdose deaths in Pennsylvania. What is an opioid? Opioids are a class of drugs. They include illegal substances like heroin. Uh, they include prescription drugs, Oxycontin, which is the name of Oxycodone, a brand name for Oxycodone, uh, Hydrocodone, also commonly known as Vicodin, uh, Codeine, Fentanyl. Uh, so, these drugs have um, something in common as far as how they interact with the opioid receptors in the body and brain. So we have opioid receptors in our cells and these drugs, so one thing that they do have in common is that they produce similar effects because they attach themselves to these opioid receptors. One of the effects is they do reduce pain and you may recognize some of those prescription drugs, Oxycontin, Vicodin, as being prescribed for pain. So they have been effective at reducing pain. And taken in large quantities, they also produce a sense of euphoria. We used to make bigger distinctions of the different drugs that we now just classify in this broader, general, more general term of opioid. Um, some are naturally derived from the poppy plant, opium, heroin, these are things that um, are produced from the poppy plant. Synthetic opioids, so things produced in a lab, fentanyl, hydrocodone, ethadone. Uh, another thing they have in common is that they're physically and psychologically addictive. Uh, so people who take them um, sometimes will become um, addicted to taking them. If they're taking them for pain, they might take more and larger quantities 
um, to alleviate that pain and then realize that they are becoming physically addicted to taking them. And if they try to stop using, uh, would have really terrible um, physical feelings, uh, withdrawal symptoms. Uh, so sometimes when people become physically addicted to these med to these drugs, um, sometimes prescription medications, um, it becomes a point of using just to feel normal because without using, the sense is so so uncomfortable um, that some people who are who are addicted are using just to kind of get back to baseline. So if we look over time, um, we see that the current overdose death rate, um, the overdose crisis is a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, overdose deaths from drugs, stable for decades. Um, and we see a, a, an increase in the 1990s, but then a really dramatic increase from the 2000s through today. To understand this um, overdose crisis, it's useful to think about it in three waves. Um, so this chart here, um, first of all, starts in 1999. The one previous was trying to just uh, look a little bit over time at the overall rate to show how, how much it has really increased in the last 20 years. Um, but this one also only looks at opioid overdoses. So I mentioned that opioids are cause of overdose deaths in 70, 80% or more of overdose deaths. Um, so it's important to look at them specifically and try to understand what is happening. And one of the useful ways to understand the last 20 years is through three waves, really, in what has occurred. So the first wave is, uh, as you can see, starts there around 1999. Um, and this is where we start seeing a significant increase in opioid related deaths from prescription drugs. So in the 1990s, pharmaceutical companies um, were heavily marketing prescription medications like Oxycontin. They were touting them to doctors and the public at large as sort of miracle drugs for dealing with pain and dealing with chronic pain in particular. And it was effective. Um, we saw a massive increase in the number of prescriptions for, um, for these opioids throughout the 90s into the 2000s. Um, and part of that marketing campaign was convincing doctors that these drugs are not addicting. So feel free to prescribe them as much and often as you like. And actually, we're also going to talk to legislators and we're going to make a whole host of issues if you don't prescribe these. Um, so there was heavy marketing saying that these are not addicting. Um, they can be widely used, commonly used, frequently used. There's not going to be any problems. Well, obviously that is not the case. And uh, subsequently you see this dramatic increase in the number of people who are dying from an um, opioid-related death from prescription drugs. That shifts um, later in um, the first decade of the 21st century. So around 2010, you can see there that the orange line, which shows um, heroin as the primary cause of death, really spikes up um, starting in 2010. So what's going on there? Uh, well, a couple of things. One is um, we had this data and we were looking at this data and seeing how much of an increase in overdoses from prescription drugs. And so there became increased regulations around the prescribing of those medications. They became more difficult to obtain. Um, so people who were addicted to them, who had been used them and having no problem whatsoever getting a prescription filled or getting a new prescription for them, all of a sudden found that they weren't able to access those substances anymore. Um, so some people who were addicted to prescription drugs switched to heroin, uh, and that's why we see this dramatic 
increase in deaths due to heroin. Uh, why do they switch to heroin? One, it's, it's available, it's widely available, and the drugs that they had been using, the prescription drugs are no longer as available. It's also cheaper. So if the person who had been using prescription medication uh, in a way that was not intended, um, they could also try buying it on the street. Um, but maybe a pill of Oxycontin is 20 or $25, uh, and then they find that a bag of heroin is $5. So uh, it's much cheaper to use heroin than it is to continue using those prescription medications. Um, so that's another reason for this, this change. Now wave three is what we're currently in. Uh, and we see this start around 2013, where the major cause of opioid overdose deaths is from synthetic opioids. Um, really dramatic increase in the last seven, eight years, um, fentanyl in particular is uh, the most common substance, the most common synthetic opioid causing overdose deaths. Uh, so what happened there? Uh, well, as more people are using things like heroin, um, we're finding that uh, fentanyl is in the substances people are using. Now, some people do seek out fentanyl and other synthetic opioids, that is their drug of choice, but it's believed it's far more common that people are taking these substances unknowingly, that they were actually trying to use a different substance like heroin, but it was um, cut with fentanyl. Fentanyl is extremely dangerous. It's extremely potent. Um, like I said, it's synthetic. It's manufactured um, largely in China and Mexico and then imported into the United States. Uh, and it's cheap. So it's cheaper than some of these other substances. So for a person who um, is selling drugs to cut their product with fentanyl increases their profit margin. Uh, so a lot of people end up taking it not realizing that it is in the substance that they are taking and because it is so potent, even a small amount can trigger an overdose. Um, so that's why we see this dramatic increase in synthetic opioids as the main cause of opioid-related deaths. So that brings us to another crisis, right? The current pandemic that we are in. Um, and that's not to say that the opioid crisis has gone away. We might not hear as much about it, um, but I think this is a good quote that kind of sums up where we are right now um, in that we haven't solved the opioid crisis. Uh, it's just that we're so inundated with information about COVID-19, the coronavirus, um, the news cycle is just so focused on that, that we don't think about the opioid crisis as much. Um, we don't have as many news stories about it. And unfortunately, when we aren't confronted in the media with an issue, sometimes we think it's just gone away. Um, but that certainly is not the case if we look more closely at what's been happening. So as the COVID-19 global pandemic continues, so does America's overdose crisis. We have seen a spike in overdoses in the past few months. So nationwide, about an 18% increase from mid-March to May in the number of overdoses. Um, more than 35 states reporting increases in overdose deaths. Um, if we look in Pennsylvania, also many counties reporting increases. So counties that had shown some positive declines between 2018 and 2019 are seeing a surge again in overdoses uh, in early 2020. Um, one example is York County. They um, reported a 75% increase in uh, overdose deaths in the first half of 2020 compared to 2019. So if we think about why this might be a problem or why this has occurred, uh, one is social isolation. Um, we've all felt uh, the problems of social isolation. Right? Um, social isolation is particularly problematic for people who have a substance use disorder. Um, People who have um, a problem with substances 
are also more likely to be depressed. So that isolation that comes from lockdown could hit them even harder. Also with the social isolation is people um, maybe using drugs by themselves more so um, when they used to use with other people. And the problem there is if you overdose and you're with someone, they can call for help. Um, but if you are using by yourself, then uh, you're much less likely to be able to be rescued if you do overdose. Um, the drug naloxone, which is the overdose reversing, um, opioid overdose reversing drug that is administered uh, commonly as Narcan, um, we know is very effective. It's effective about 90% of the time when it's administered, it reverses an overdose and the person survives but someone has to actually be there to administer it. Um, unfortunately, um, we've also seen some cases where uh, police and community members might be less likely to use naloxone when confronted with an overdose. There was a police department in Indiana and at least one in Texas, where early on in the pandemic, they instructed their police officers not to administer naloxone, that it was too dangerous, they should remain six away from a person who overdosed if they respond to an overdose call and then just wait for paramedics to arrive. And this is a problem because when someone overdoses, time is crucial and getting them naloxone as soon as possible increases the likelihood that they will survive the overdose. Um, so it's problematic if they're not receiving that um, as soon as they could be. <clears throat> Another issue is uh, changes to illicit drug supply chains. Um, so we all know with the pandemic that when we go to the store, sometimes the things we're looking for aren't there, um, that there have been supply chains disrupted in all kinds of legitimate markets. Well, the same thing happens in the illicit drug market. Uh, so people who were able to access certain substances one way, maybe not, they don't have that access anymore. Um, so they try to buy drugs from someone they haven't bought from before. Um, where they, they change and they buy something different. Uh, so this can, this can lead to more overdoses, it's more dangerous. Heightened anxiety. Um, heightened anxiety is a near trigger, universal trigger for drug use. Um, and it's really difficult to think of a more stressful event right now than this pandemic. Um, just the uncertainty of everything. Um, we certainly have seen an increase in illicit drug use and in alcohol use. Um, alcohol sales uh, went up about 25% um, from mid-March. Um, so, you know, illicit and licit, you see people trying to cope with isolation and anxiety by using substances. This pandemic has also hit people hard financially. Um, again, the anxiety and stress from unemployment, loss of income uh, can lead someone to, um, to resort to using substances, or if they were in a, in a period of recovery, to relapse into using it again. Another issue is the possible um, overwork hospitals. So one of the strategies that has been effective in engaging order into treatment is if they do overdose and then they are taken into an emergency room, a lot of hospitals have programs in place where while they're in the emergency room, they can access drug treatment services. And this has been very beneficial for getting people into treatment very soon after an overdose. But if the hospital is really hit hard with COVID cases, um, then they just might not have the time deal with um, people coming in after an overdose and giving them that same level of attention, those same services that they had previously. For those who are in treatment, there has been a, a huge disruption um, to the treatment process. Uh, social isolation, um, again, um, if people, you know, during lockdown, um, there were no in-person like 12-step meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. Um, so people weren't able to attend these peer support groups that for many people are very helpful 
in the recovery process. Um, and some are virtual, but there is something about that physical connection for people that's just not there. Um, if you've ever attended one of these meetings, you see people um, hold hands, people hug each other. There's something about that physical closeness that is important and that provides, that increases the emotional um, support from these peer groups. And that's just completely lacking in a virtual setting. Inpatient treatment facilities uh, have largely still been operating um, like they had been before the pandemic, except for they've increased distance within the facilities. So people would not share rooms, there'd be more spacing. So again, decreasing that level of physical support that can be happening in that setting. Outpatient treatment has all moved to teletherapy. Um, so people who used to meet in person in a group session instead will meet with that group online. Now this can have some positive effects uh, because some people like, like that mode. Um, and this is probably best for people who have already been in treatment, um, where they have a group, they already identify with this group, they already have a sense of camaraderie with this group, and they're moving from in person to online. Um, and it means, you know, maybe before they had to travel a great distance to go to that group, and now they, just, they don't need to. Um, so there could be some benefits to that. People starting treatment um, might feel the stigma of that and might not want to go physically to a facility where they have to walk into a drug treatment center. They might like that they can just go from their computer and have um, a little bit of anonymity in the process. Um, but it, there's probably also a lot of problems. Um, in particular, thinking about technology and access. Uh, so people in substance abuse treatment, some of them um, just don't have a laptop, don't have a tablet, don't have Wi-Fi, where you know, the means to actually um, do this kind of teletherapy. Um, so that's a problem. There was one doctor in Maryland who actually talked about some of his patients in group in these um, virtual group sessions. And um, he knew some who would go and sit in their car in a McDonald's parking lot so that they could access the Wi-Fi because they didn't have it at home. Um, so, it's, so there's definitely drawbacks to that as well. Um, medication assisted treatment. So part of the treatment process, some people receive um, medication. This is shown to be extremely effective in dealing with opioid use disorders. Um, methadone, buprenorphine, suboxone is the, is the named, um, named drug for, for buprenorphine. Um, so these are highly effective treatments, but they've been more difficult with the pandemic. Methadone uh, is a very tightly restricted substance. People who use methadone as part of treatment typically have to visit every day to access the medication. And with um, the, just this disruption to life in general, if you're in an urban environment and you depended on the bus to take you to get um, methadone in the morning, well, bus service might have been disrupted. Um, so one of the things that they did do statewide is uh, loosen some of those restrictions so people could take home large quantities um, instead of having to go to a facility daily. Um, overall, that's a good thing, but it's also something that does need to be monitored. We need to be careful, um, make sure people understand the dose that they're supposed to take, um, understand, you know, not to take more. Um, so, you know, it, there are concerns still with that kind, um, with, with, um, with that. Buprenorphine is another medication used opioid use disorder. The difference between buprenorphine and methadone is buprenorphine can be prescribed by a doctor and it just is in your normal doctor-patient relationship. So you go to your doctor, your general practitioner, you have an opioid use disorder, they also prescribe you Suboxone um, as a daily medication for helping with, with your opioid use disorder. Um, one of the issues though is that there are a lot of pharmacies that refuse to carry it. There's stigma around the use of medications opioid use addiction, uh, opioid use disorder, sorry, and 
as a result, some pharmacies have refused to carry this. Um, so that's a problem. Again, people not able to access actual treatment that they need. So what can be done? Um, there is a small bright spot in that 2019 data. There are a cluster of states in the Northeast, Massachusetts, New York, Vermont, New, and uh, Rhode Island that saw substantial declines in their overdose death rates. Uh, and these are states that have shown a commitment to preventing overdoses and getting people access to treatment if they want it. So we know that it can be done, that we can actually decrease overdose deaths. We can um, do something positive to address this crisis. Uh, one of the things that has been shown to be helpful is increasing access to naloxone. In Pennsylvania, law enforcement officers all um, have access or trained and carry uh, naloxone. Uh, we've had more increase in community use of naloxone as well. Um, I, along with my colleague, um, Dr. Russell in applied psychology, we hosted some training sessions on campus last December and February where we trained faculty, staff, and students how to use Narcan, gave them naloxone to take with them um, so that they would be able to address an overdose if, if they were confronted with one. So we need to increase those trainings, increase just community participation in, in normalizing that this is something that is a strategy for dealing with this. Um, it, it helps keep people, well, it saves lives. Another thing is to decrease punishment around drug use. Uh, we did pass Act 139 in Pennsylvania. It's known as the Good Samaritan Law. And that um, meant that people who witnessed an overdose um, could call paramedics, first responders, police, uh, and have people come address an overdose. And they didn't have to worry about being arrested for drug use or having possession of illicit substances. Um, so that's one step um, that has increased in the likelihood that someone will actually call and get help uh, if they know that they're not going to then be arrested on the scene. Um, but unfortunately, we've seen some increases in the use of punishment. Um, one is a lot of uh, an increase in counties in Pennsylvania that are charging people felony murder charges if they share drugs with someone and then that person dies. So friends sharing substance um, and one person dies at, of an overdose after using that substance, um, there's some areas where that, that other person would be charged with felony murder. Um, I don't think that's the right step. Um, it, there's no evidence that this is an effective policy. It does not um, decrease substance use, it only makes people more likely not to call for help if there is a problem. We need to provide more opportunities for people to engage in treatment. Uh, if we're going to continue with telehealth for outpatient services, make sure people have the access to the technology that they need so that they can actually engage in this kind of therapy. We have warm handoff programs in Berks County, so when people do overdose and end up in the emergency room, uh, they can access drug treatment services through emergency department. We have an innovative program called Blue Cares in Berks County. And this is where after someone has an overdose and they're revived, a police officer and a certified recovery specialist, that's a person who's in long-term recovery, they make a visit to the person's house and have a conversation with the person who overdosed, try to engage them in treatment, uh, talk to their family members, give their family members resources. Because as we know, this is something that really impacts families as well. And um, it has been an opportunity to engage with the community uh, in a positive way to try to engage, to encourage people to go to treatment and try to give people the support and resources that, that they need. Um, unfortunately, with the pandemic, this is one of those programs that um, they're not doing the, the way they were. They're not making in Right now, they're doing follow-up phone calls uh, after with, with people who have overdosed. Um, we need more harm reduction. Syringe exchange programs have shown to be very effective at reducing disease transmission, 
Um, so for people who inject drugs, uh, slowing down the, the transmission of HIV, hepatitis, very effective, um, but not widespread enough. Fentanyl test strips, um, these are actually still considered illegal in Pennsylvania. This is, um, someone could actually test their drugs and see if there was fentanyl in them and then you know, make a, an informed decision about whether or not they're gonna use them. Uh, research shows that people would use these, people who use illicit drugs would use these, um, that most of them don't want to use substances that are infected with fentanyl. Um, and, but we, there, it's a very controversial idea. Um, so we, we do not at the moment endorse that kind of um, policy. So I do think overall we need honest, open conversations, try to engage people, um, have honest and real conversations about drug use. If you know someone who is feeling more anxious because of the pandemic, feeling isolated, it's important to reach out. It's important to ask them how they're doing. If you know they're in treatment for a substance use disorder, ask them how it's going. Ask them um, you know, what, what help they might need. Try to keep those conversations open um, as one way of reducing stigma, talking about things. Um, and stigma is a significant problem. Um, so we need to continue to have policies that try to reduce stigma. So with that, I'm going to conclude my talk here so that we have some time for questions. Um, but I think this is a really good quote just to kind of sum up where we're at. Um, you know, the, the crisis was, was a significant problem before COVID-19, and it's going to continue to be long after um, we get over this virus. So it's something that we should continue talking about and thinking about solutions to. And with that, I'll also um, leave you with some information here. If you or someone you know does need help for a substance use disorder, um, you can contact Burke's Council on Chemical Abuse and they will have all kinds of resources for treatment. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Murphy, for you know the discussion on the convergence of the two crises, and you know that last quote really you know hits home that this is going to be around you know beyond you know the time that we find a vaccine that I talked about last week um, for the the COVID nineteen. So with that, um, thank you, and I'm going to invite uh, Sonia to um, start our question and answer. Sure, and I'll invite our audience again. Um, any attendees, please submit your questions um, for Dr. Murphy. Um, Dr. Murphy, I would like to ask, in your opinion, what are the factors that may contribute to Pennsylvania's elevated overdose deaths? So we looked at those slides, which I've, I've never seen before, to be honest with you. Um, but can you, can you tell us some of those potential factors or the, like your opinion surrounding what's going on in Pennsylvania and, and why do we have so many overdose deaths here? Sure. So like that one graph also showed, it's, it's regional when we look at the United States and Pennsylvania kind of clusters with those other really hard hit states like Ohio, West Virginia. Um, so, you know, there, there's different ideas of, of why um, that might be. I think some compelling evidence is, you know, these are areas that saw economic decline in the last 20, 30 years. You know, this is kind of the former Rust Belt area. Um, massive decline in manufacturing jobs in the last 30, 40 years, um, higher rates of unemployment, you know, people just um, economically not as well off as they once were, um, and that being a possible contributor to, um, to then substance use. Uh, also, if you look at the marketing of pharmaceuticals, um, it was, there were certain areas where it was uh, stronger. Um, Ohio, for instance, um, pharmaceutical companies were very effective at passing, getting some laws passed in Ohio, um, which would actually hurt hospitals if they received low ratings from patients as far as them, how they dealt with pain. Um, so, you know, so you see a massive uptick in the number of prescriptions in some of these areas and and um and then when it moves to the illicit drug market it 
just kind of trickles over into different parts of the state as well. I think that's why southwestern part of Pennsylvania, which connects to West Virginia and Ohio, in the graph I showed today, has seen improvements, but through the beginning of the crisis was the hardest hit. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question that was submitted by one of our audience members. What is the opioid outlook if the pandemic continues into 2022 and 2023 and current social distancing protocols remain in place? I think it's, it doesn't look good. I think if uh, people continue to be isolated, that we're gonna see more overdoses, we're gonna see um, just more of the negative consequences of that. I mean, we all feel it, right? We all feel the anxiety and the stress and the boredom um, that comes with it. And if you're someone who's susceptible, susceptible uh, to a substance use disorder, it's just gonna affect you much worse. And um, I just, I think unless we think of ways to really engage people in other ways and make them feel a part of a community, uh, then it's going to just continue to be a significant problem. Thank you. I, I know you mentioned the training opportunity that you offered to the campus. Um, and it led me to think about, like, we talked about the age ranges that are impacted by these overdose deaths. Um, but I guess my question for you is, do do opioids discriminate? You know, is there a more um, prone group that is susceptible to being likely to, to um, you know, suffer the consequences of an opioid overdose? Like, what, what, what are your, your thoughts on that? I think this is something that affects everyone. Um, and we have seen increases in older populations uh, in overdoses. Um, so this is certainly something that's not just a young person's problem, um, that it is, it's across the board and we need to recognize that. Um, I think that uh, some people might be more susceptible if they were prescribed medication or for something like pain, you know, a, a broken knee, shoulder, something um, that we need to be should be aware of the potential that that can lead to opioid addiction. Um, but it, it, I think it's something that affects every age group. And um, it's something that, you know, we, we need to maybe think about strategies a little bit different depending on age groups. Um, but it's certainly a problem for older people as well. Thank you. Dr. Murphy, I actually have a question. Um, can you talk maybe a little bit more about the controversial sort of, um, pro, I don't want to even call proactive, but you, you mentioned the fentanyl strips being um, not legal in Pennsylvania. Um, the other thing came to my mind was I know the city of Philadelphia had um, some issues with trying to start their first safe house. So are there places in um, this, in our country that are trying some of these um, lack of better words, maybe more liberal type of methods and or maybe for our audience, can you just kind of outline, you know, what are the, the, um, the pros and the cons or, or what are, what, what is the controversy over in, in terms of the people on both sides of that issue? Sure. So those different policies or methods that you're talking about, we generally um, refer to in a larger umbrella called harm reduction. And Harm reduction tends to be a part of our larger policy in thinking about drugs, but it's always played a very, very small role. And in some other countries, it plays a very pivotal role. Um, we have seen recently with the opioid crisis, it increased use of naloxone. That's actually a harm reduction technique, right? So this idea that we increase access to naloxone, we make it freely available to people you don't need you don't even need a prescription anymore you used to need a prescription to get naloxone you don't need a prescription anymore anyone can walk into a pharmacy and get it you know from the pharmacist you don't there's a standing order in pennsylvania from dr levine right so you don't need your own prescription anyone can access it so that's a harm reduction strategy that if we can save someone's life then that's a good thing and the 
reasoning behind harm reduction strategies and why they tend to be controversial is because they don't necessarily emphasize um, eliminating the problem. They, they talk about it more as let's deal with some of the other issues that come about because of the drug problem. So uh, syringe exchange, for instance, um, syringe exchange programs unequivocally have been shown to reduce disease transmission. Um, and we're talking about decades of research on this. Um, so that people who inject drugs, if you give them access to uh, clean needles, and they're like, they are likely to take you up on that, and um, then you see a dramatic decrease in the transmission of infectious diseases like hepatitis and HIV. Um, but they're controversial because you're not eliminating the drug use. You are, some people would say you're condoning drug use because you are giving them a mechanism to use drugs. Um, I think that's part of the problem in, in the moralizing about drug use and that that creeps into our policies in that we just generally think drugs are bad so you shouldn't ever have policy that tells people it's okay to use drugs. And I would argue having syringe exchange doesn't tell people it's okay to use drugs. And as part of these programs and, and some of the places they've been effective, like in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, um, they also become a place to get resources. They become a place for people to access information about treatment if they want treatment. Um, so they, they serve a broader good as well. Um, but their mission is not to eliminate drug use. Their eliminate is to deal with some of the public health things that come along with drug use, like disease. Um, so I think that's where the controversy lies in that if we're having a policy that is not telling people it's bad to use drugs, then we're more reluctant to adopt it. And that's the same with the fentanyl test strips, right? Giving people access to the means where they can actually see what is in the product that they want to consume, we think is saying it's okay. Some people think is saying it's okay to use drugs. Um, and I think people who advocate for more harm reduction strategies argue that um, we need to think about this as a public health problem and we need to alleviate um, you know, some of the negative public health things. Overdoses is, is not a good thing. People dying from an overdose is not a good thing. Um, so giving them access to resources that might cut down on overdoses is a good thing. And that's their philosophy um, in harm reduction. But it does, it, it brings in this, this idea of, you know, what, what we, what we say about the morality of drug use. Um, and you mentioned the supervised injection facility, safe house, um, in Philadelphia, still not open, right? Um, large community, um, uh, responds negative about, uh, opening that kind of facility. And these facilities do operate in other countries and they've shown to have positive impacts on reducing overdoses, um, you know, not increasing, not increasing drug use, um, not increasing crime associated with drug use. Um, but it is, it's a different philosophy. And I think it's one where we, we've seen some shift, especially with the naloxone distribution um, but we're still, you know, we're, we're still not quite as far along, um, definitely as, as what some other countries are doing. That's actually my next question. Do you have some specifics about what, um, how the U.S. compares to other countries when looking at like drug overdose rates or the approach to how they are uh, tackling this pandemic? I know a couple, couple chats ago, we had somebody here comparing and contrasting how uh, the world was um, responding to COVID-19 versus how the U.S. was. So maybe just some insight on of other countries would be helpful yeah. as well. Um, well, we're number one. <laughs> um, so yeah, so drug overdose deaths is um, by far highest in the United States than in any other country. Um, it's, it's, so part of that is we've had this massive increase in opioid related deaths that a lot of other countries haven't had. A lot of that comes from the pharmaceutical marketing that I talked about earlier. And that just doesn't exist in other countries. 
um, you know, this idea that drug companies can freely advertise their products on television to consumers is unheard of in other countries. Um, that would just never be allowed. Um, the, the kind of marketing that pharmaceutical companies do to doctors, which has, you know, been more restricted recently, but, you know, taking them out and taking them, like, giving them these lavish meals and vacations and everything, um, just things that other countries wouldn't allow pharmaceutical companies to do. So pharmaceutical companies just didn't have, they, they didn't have the prescription drug problem that we had, which, which has have this ripple effect like we see today. Um, and then as far as dealing with <clears throat> drug addiction problems in their country, some have taken um, some very strong steps in certain directions that have had really good outcomes. So for instance, Portugal. Portugal decriminalized all drug use in the early 2000s. And um, what that meant is that drugs t still technically are illegal, but if someone is caught with possession of a substance, any substance, um, they get a ticket, right? Kind of like we would get a parking ticket. And um, they then are supposed to see a council who talks to them and tries to see what might be going on, see if this person needs treatment, give them access to maybe some resources. Uh, and it's shown to be an extremely effective policy as far as reducing drug use um, and uh, just having other all kinds of, you know, better outcomes at, you know, public health wise. Uh, I took students to the Netherlands um, over spring break in 2019 so that we can look at some of their drug policies. And it, we saw um, a facility that uh, gave prescription heroin as a maintenance drug, right? So we're talking about people who were severely addicted to heroin could go to this hospital and twice a day be given free government-sponsored heroin um, as a way to just kind of maintain their physical addiction to the substance. Um, unheard of, right? <laughs> Here, um, but when you talk to the people who worked in these programs, you know they they talked about how the dramatic change they saw in the neighborhood after having this clinic there. That the that there was just large scale homelessness and discarded needles, you know, and that people had to walk over and crime, people getting cars broken into all the time, like this kind of stuff. And then they put in this clinic and a lot of those problems went away. Um, so it, the people saw it as a positive thing, uh, you know, and, and because it was a controversial policy even there, you know, maybe there was initially some, some backlash, but I also think people just have more faith in their leaders. And if, you know, the leaders who are looking at the science are saying, well, this, is, this looks like this could be a policy that can influence things in, in, in a really positive way, right? Reduce homelessness, reduce crime, clean up the neighborhood. Why don't we give it a try? And they saw those positive results. And what was also interesting was when we were speaking with a nurse who was one of the ones working in this clinic, she talked about how this program started in the 90s and they've just seen this rapid decline in people who seek out the program because they don't have heroin just isn't as common there. Like they've just like, those people are still using, the people that maybe were using 30 years ago, but there's not this great increase in new heroin users. So she saw, she said, you know, I could see five years from now, this clinic not even existing because we don't even have this significant problem anymore. Uh, so it, it was, it's interesting to see what some other countries are doing. And I think we can learn a lot. Um, in thinking about our own policy and being more pragmatic. That is such a phenomenal example of how you're able to share that week-long experience in the Netherlands that you have with your students with so many more people. Like that, that's an eye-opening thing because I think 
when people suggest the possibility of group homes or halfway houses, not, not, not my community, They're like it's great, but not in my neighborhood, you know, see, so like almost if you uh, had a set of lobbyists for this group for the, for the opioid crisis could help be a little more transformative as, as a person of the just say no, and this is your brain on drugs generation. You know, I, I could definitely see when I was following your chart, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. If people want to get high, they're going to find a way to do it, you know, and, and it's kind of, I guess I just, my heart goes out to everybody who's research or involved in this area because it's such a moving target. Like, even if you jump on one thing, there's still, you know, the cost, the availability, you know, there's just so much variability. So that, that was a really great example. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think you're right in that, uh, you know, I, I mean, as a researcher, I think a lot of us get frustrated because we value um, you know, science, and we value uh, results based on rigorous evaluation of data. And it's frustrating when then people just make arguments that have nothing to do with that. It's just, you know, um, it's frustrating. I just have one more real brief question. You know, I can go get my hair done now. I can go grab a burger, maybe not a beer from a bar, right? But uh, how, you know, now that we're starting to slowly open back up, um, are people able to access drug treatment um, with the current, you know, social distancing things in place? Or has that been sort of something that's been also shut down still? Yeah, most places still, um, outpatient wise, it's still a tele um telehealth kind of situation and i'm not sure exactly what would change to move that in a different direction because we did become green you know and that didn't change so um i i don't know if that's just um a, a safety measure that is going to exist as long as we're in this pandemic at all um but um know as far as those in-person 12-step meetings or outpatient therapy as of now it's still mostly virtual um and i don't see that changing great thank you all right well i just want to thank you one more time dr murphy uh, for chatting with us today about the drug overdose and the covid 19 pandemics and um, how they have converged here so special thank you to all of you who are joining us for today's line side chat as you click out of the webinar you will receive access to a survey please do take a few minutes required to complete the survey to let us know what you thought about today's chat and perhaps offer some ideas for future chats as well you are encouraged to reach out to us via email and we remind you to keep checking our websites. We just added a bunch of chats um, for the upcoming months uh, this morning, actually. Our next chat as uh, listed here is uh, really geared towards um, incoming freshmen um, at Penn State or any students, but it is next Tuesday, um, August 18th, and it is entitled Professors Spill Student Success Secrets. So if you wanna know how to be uh, very successful from the secrets uh, of all the professors at Penn State Berks, please uh, join us for that chat. So be sure to come back soon, meet with another faculty, staff, or student from Penn State Berks to share their experiences. Uh, stay safe, Berks and beyond, and we are signing off until next time. This has been the Penn State Berks Lionside Chats. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Thank, Thank you. you.